the quote now at itsforwomen.ie and see why we're trusted by over 130,000 women in Ireland. In these uncertain times, we discover the best in each other and in our communities. Your local community pharmacy is working hard in difficult circumstances to supply the medicines you need and the advice you trust. We are asking people to be understanding of small delays and, if possible, phone ahead to make arrangements for collecting your prescription. Your local community pharmacy. Always here for you. Brought to you by the Irish Pharmacy Union. This is an important safety message from Dunn Stores. To keep our customers and colleagues safe, we ask that where possible you go alone to your nearest Dunn Stores. Avoid rush hour and spend as little time as possible in the shop. Stay the recommended distance of two metres away from others and be patient in queues. If you were shopping on behalf of others and need help, please ask. Please protect and respect store teams who continue to provide an important service. Use contactless payment where possible. Thanks for your understanding. Dunn Stores, always there for our customers. Hello Ireland. Hello green hair drying. Hello green vacuuming. Green box set binging. Green hedge cutting. Hello green cups of coffee. Hello green family dinners. Hello 100% green electricity from Ibadrola, one of the world's biggest renewable energy companies. To get a great deal on energy you can feel good about, visit ebadrola.ie forward slash hello. Ebadrola Ireland Limited guarantees your electricity is sourced from 100% renewable generation subject to verification under the CRU's GSPV verification process after operating for a full year. In these difficult times, many businesses are still very much open for business and still need to communicate with their customers. Radio can help. Right now, it's playing an even bigger role keeping people in Ireland informed and entertained. And the latest technology means that even with social distancing, radio ads can still be made and broadcast safely. Radio. Business as usual even when it's not business as usual. For more information, email info at fmjunction.ie. Off the ball. This this is News Talk. Now, welcome back. So, uh, really, if all things were right with the world, we should be sitting down and enjoying some Champions League action with our good colleagues over at Virgin Media Sport this evening. Alas, that is not happening, but we are bringing our uh, Champions League Best Moment series with thanks to Virgin Media Sport, hashtag WeFreeSport uh, to you over the uh, coming weeks with Neil Meller on uh, last night talking about the Olympiacos game. Really good stuff from him. Uh, this evening, we've decided to give uh, Chelsea the treatment and, well, who else could we draft in? Only the one and only. That's you, Pat and Evan. How are you doing? Never talk over the music. You know, it <laughs> has to be fading out. Uh, I'm very well. Very good indeed. Um, still things all quite cool here uh, in the Scottish borders. I think people are living in the kind of rural areas don't seem to have it quite as bad just now what's going on with the coronavirus. But, you know, uh, still locked down and uh, still just going out for the one run. And being in the isolation, as is the case in many parts of rural Ireland, you're in isolation anyway. Mm. You, you can't help it. There's just nobody around. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we, we've thrown you a slightly uh, strange one this evening. We're doing a little uh, Cham Champions League moments type uh, series. And, well, we asked you to pick out the Champions League game or games which uh, stick in your mind. And you're giving us the Chelsea treatment this evening. Yeah, because, I mean, everyone thinks of Chelsea now. If you're, if you're quite a young chap or chap -esque. Looking at football just now, you think Chelsea, one of the great clubs, you know, one of the big European powerhouses. Yeah, sure, that wasn't the case up until just before, or about the Roman Abramovich era. And the Roman era started in 2004 when he bought over the club. Before that, he'd actually come a little bit closer than people realised. Um, he got to the quarterfinals against Barcelona a couple of years before that. They got to the semi-finals um, against Monaco when uh, Claudio Ranieri was in charge and he made some uh, extreme substitutions in a game away at Monaco, which yeah. nobody understood and led, it led, some people think, to Chelsea going out and uh, it led after that to Roman coming in, you know, getting Mourinho in and suddenly it kind of blossomed from there. When I say it blossomed, it still took a hell of a long time to win that Champions League and a hell of a lot of money. I do remember that away game to Monaco very vividly and uh, the sense from a Chelsea point of view of this massive missed opportunity. Yeah, I mean, people have actually misremembered it in a lot of ways because I mean, it, it, Chelsea had actually done okay to get that far. I mean, well done, semi-final, but it's only Monaco. 
Now, the score ends up 5-3, you know, after the both legs. Mm. But Chelsea were in a good position in the first leg. They were 1-0 down going near the end of the game. But what happened then was Ranieri, he went for it, decided, I want to get the away goal, and did go for it. Now, the odd thing is, he did then get away, he got the away goal, and it went 1-1. But because of the extreme changes that he made at that point in time, I've got them written down here. Uh, Gronky came on for Veron, very positive move there. Melchior come on for he come on for uh, Jimmy Floyd has about come on as well so for Melchior mm. so two real forward minded players there and uh, Hoot went off for uh, come on for Scotty Parker really changed it up, adapted it got a goal really quite quickly and then lost two goals very quickly that was Chelsea three one down back at the bridge they had to chase it and they get a two two draw back there and went out but it was those extreme changes and sometimes luck favours the brave but. I don't think people, you know, held out a, a lot of belief that he was going to do anything in the game after that. Wrong. <laughs> it did quite well with Leicester City after that. No, it's but, true. It, it it really damaged them though, didn't it, Ranieri? That felt like I I don't I'm not even sure from memory how much longer he stayed at the club, but for for like in terms of my memory of him, that was his last night. Yeah, and it's considered really that he'd blown what could be Chelsea's only chance. Mm. You know, Bramovich didn't come until the June of that season, so it was a few months later. So many, many people thought Chelsea had waited all those years to get to the cusp of the Champions League final in that semi-final against a good but beatable team and never managed to do it. But I mean, I, I think that's right in history in a slightly unfair way. You know, he had a right good go at it and Chelsea were in some ways a little bit unlucky in that. But their time hadn't happened yet. Their time was still to come. It needed a lot of money. It needed a lot of brilliant big names to come in as well. I mean, they had a lot of big names. Probably had the period after that was they had Barcelona in front of them. And Chelsea had this long run mm. of games against Barcelona. And I was at a lot of them, you know, particularly the ones down at Stamford Bridge. And Barcelona, as we all know, what a phenomenal side they were. They're an absolutely amazing side. And Chelsea ran them close a good few times. I mentioned just before the Roman era, they beat 5-1 in one game with Barcelona. They were a long way behind. But quite quickly, they actually they, they caught up in that. There was a 5-4 um, win after, after two legs. Uh, as usual, Didier Drogba scored and Lampard scored, and they got all the way through. That was 2004-2005. They beat uh, Bayern Munich on the way there in the, in the next round, 6-5, to find themselves in the semi-final against Liverpool. Mm. And Chelsea thought they had a right good chance in 2004-2005. And uh, if, I, if that memory serves me right, that was the one with the gold that never was. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I'll absolutely pick up on that in just a moment. Just to say briefly, though, the greatest moment of all the Chelsea Barcelona games in the Champions League, and in some respects, in my head, they've they've, they've kind of moulded together into mm. one. But the moment that stands out for me, well, if you say Chelsea Barcelona in that era vaguely, it is the Ronaldinho toe poke. Yeah, I remember people saying, oh, it's only a toe poke. And I think that's one of the best skills there is in the game. It's totally and utterly unreadable. Keepers always set themselves. They talk about getting themselves set. So they wait for the, the, the leg to move, the angle of your body. I remember talking for a long time to Neville South, but this one was at Everton. And he said that's how he read it. He, he knew by your body shape roughly where it's going. And even if you tried to disguise, but he hated the toe pole. There was two things he hated, scoops and toe poles. Huh. And any time I did any of the two of them, he would basically chase me out of the, dressing, out of the whole training ground. But a toe poke, you know, there's nothing much you can do about it. I mean, trying to get the top line, that's one line you talk about there. I mean, there are so many incredible moments over a long period of time. I mean, a lot of people remember the Iniesta goal in the last minute in another game. Mm. That's another great chance that Chelsea had, and that was the 90th minute. So, I mean, there's so many you can go into when we finally get to my favourite moment, it is a moment with Chelsea against Barcelona, but it's none of those ones, and it's, it's stuck with me, but it's a wee bit further on. OK, excellent. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to your favourite moment. We'll finish on that point then. Uh, you mentioned those Liverpool games. Now, so 4 5 5 is the uh, ghost goal, I'm sure Chelsea fans call uh, Garcia's yeah, goal, sure. which sent Liverpool on their way to Istanbul. I must say, I don't remember that period of football, those Chelsea-Liverpool games, with any fondness. I was, uh, I was uh, in college, yes, for memories. I was still playing football, football obsessed, loved it, and it just wasn't my bag. I didn't like, I liked, um, I liked Mourinho arriving in English football and found him fascinating and he was charismatic and good-looking and all this kind of stuff was great. Um, but those Chelsea-Liverpool games 
as intense uh, a spectacle as they were, I didn't like where Mourinho and Rafa seemed to be taking the game. I was, I was watching all of that uh, very nervously, I have to say, because I didn't enjoy it. Well, you talk about the two semi-finals that were in close proximity, proximity then, the 2004-2005, mm. and then the 6-7. Well, over the period of four games, the score, if, you know, four entire games, the score was 2-1. <laughs> you know, first one was 1-0, and the second one was 1-0 at Chelsea at uh, Stamford Bridge, and 1-0 over uh, up at Anfield. <clears throat> that one went to penalties. So you're right, it wasn't hyper exciting, you know, and it's hard to know who to blame for that because you're talking about that 2004 one, the 0 1. It wasn't a great game of football. But Chelsea had played Barca in, and Bayern Munich in the previous rounds, you know, aggregate scores in both those games 5 4 and 6 5. Mm. So, you know, it's, I'm not blaming Liverpool completely for this. It's just Rafa and Mourinho together, you know, kind of had that kind of effect. Yeah. And that was also where, you know, Chelsea fans grew their hatred of Rafa Benitez at that point in time and little were they to know in time to come that Rafa would be on their doorstep and knocking the door. But no, it wasn't, uh, you're absolutely right, the games were tense. I mean, but being at the stadiums and for those games, they were extraordinarily tense. So you're wrapped up in that. It mm. kind of, it was one of them, if you were a supporter of either team, because we're both semi-finals, you know, you were completely and utterly wrapped up in the meaning and the moment of the time. Yeah. And again, go back to for Chelsea's point of view, yeah, Liverpool had won it plenty of times before. <laughs> it was all right for them. Chelsea hadn't. And we thought, we kept on thinking every time, this must be it. This must be it. Another semi-final. Oh, it's Liverpool. We're capable of beating them. And every time they'd find, you know, the closest, they'd get so, so close, you know, and get to, you know, extra time. Then penalties, then lose it. I think it was 4 1 in penalties as well. So for, for Chelsea fans at the time, it was torture. It was roughly about that time. I think that's when Chelsea fans thought if it doesn't happen very, very soon, it ain't going to happen. But then it was the next season, uh, 7, 2007 2008, there was a 4 3 where Chelsea, Didier Drogba, starts coming on the scene and battering in goals mm -hmm. against Liverpool. And that was the semi final that obviously led to the, them getting to the final over in Moscow and the yeah. Lushniki Stadium. And, you know, even the Chelsea fans, remember talking to them then, I didn't know many. I travelled over to that game. I went to Lushniki for that game. And I didn't know many who thought they were going to win. It had just been so painful for so long. And they found such, they, they, almost, they were almost Scottish. That's, <laughs> the way, that's the way they were. Finding weird and complicated ways of blowing it. And Chelsea just time and again. And by the time, you got over to the Luzhniki. And if I can tell you a wee personal story about yeah. my route over there, um, I, the club were really kind enough to ask a number of us who'd played in, you know, in the history of the club uh, to go over, to over as guests. And I thought, that's great. Two minor problems. One was three days previously, I had uh, a new hip. <laughs> and you're not supposed to travel. And you're definitely not supposed to travel on Aeroflot, <laughs> which is what we ended up going on. It was the most horrendous journey, honestly. It was just, I can't explain how bad it was. So the pain, not, constantly in painkillers. We ended up having to go overnight the night before to get there. So no sleep, go to the game. The horror that was it for the game, we'll come back to in a minute for Chelsea. And then by the time afterwards we got back home, it was six o'clock the next morning and I had to go straight to another game. Celtic were playing Dundee United to win the league, and I was covering that for Five Live. Mm. And I'd had these, I, I've never hallucinated my life before mm. until then. But it, it was an extraordinary thing that, that you know, anyone who can remember it. Again, not convinced it was the best game I've ever seen. You know, for Man United and Chelsea to go all the way to Moscow, mm. the organisation was horrendous. You, you've heard me waxing uh, lyrically about how much I love Moscow now and, you know, the World Cup was great there, the Russians did it right. Boy, did they make a backside of it on that occasion. Two different uh, airports everyone had to get into. Us was south of, uh, of, of Moscow. We got up there in ages early. I'm still on the crutches, utter mm -hmm. agony. Get in, watch the game. And, of course, with Chelsea fans, they had the chance to win it. JT slips as he takes a penalty. Everyone thinks it was him that lost it. Um, but in actual fact, it was an Elka that was, it's one of those things that plays in people's mind, they forget about it. No, it was yeah, an Elka. It was 100% JT, that is, uh, that is history. Exactly, yeah. but it wasn't. It was actually an Elka that missed the penalty. Also, stupid things like 
because of the, the desperation, not just in the Chelsea fans, but Chelsea Football Club and all the players, Drogba, Drogba got sent off near the end of that game. He would have been one of the main penalty kick takers. Mm. Had Drogba not been sent off, it probably would have been him walking up to take that penalty kick and not John Terry. And that's all they had to do to win the cup. Yeah. So there's a million different things that all go on at the same time. And I, my memory is getting back. It's hilarious. So we ended up in these sharabangs, these old buses. And we were stuck for about five hours outside the airport, bucket and rain, fed up, not slept, crutches, you name it. And eventually we get let in the airport. And we were told the reason why we had to wait five hours is because the VIPs had to leave first. Well, of course. So Patini and his mates, we're all having their big dinners and their slap-up meals and their champagnes. They get ferried, they get their private jets out. Then they let us on the planes. And this was the best. I've never had anything like this in my life before. So all these Chelsea fans, and some of them are going to London, Stansted, Heathrow, the cars are everywhere. Some of them are going to Manchester. I'm trying to get back to Edinburgh. Because there are all these different flights on. They just said, get on a plane. No matter which one. Get on a plane, pot luck. You'll end up where you end up. <laughs> we just walked on planes. I ended up miles. I was. I think I ended up um, Luton, and I wanted to be you know, miles away. But you had to. You just had to get out Gosh. of there. And I can remember a line afterwards in Platini telling everybody afterwards. This is when I decided I didn't like Michel Platini anymore. Um, he came on afterwards and said it was the best organised Champions League finals I've ever been. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, if you're a VIP, you get. I think he'd lost, I think he'd lost the common touch by that point. But we were a wee bit angry at that point. And by that point, all Chelsea fans had decided it's never going to happen. Yeah. That was the best chance. That was a such a strong team. You know, like you know, likes of you know, Drogba there as well, Terry there as well, Cavalli, all the big players that you want there were all there. And they still managed to blow it. And it, again, it was penalty kicks and they, and they couldn't manage it. Yeah, no, that one's incredibly memorable, that 08 final for sure, for a whole host of reasons. The 2012 win, eventually, uh, climbing the summit, uh, memorable from, and I see it, this is an interesting exercise for me because you've looked into all these and I frankly have had too busy a day to do that. So here, I'm giving you my uh, memories and it's kind of interesting then to see what the reality was. So my memories are this. Uh, Chelsea, it was an incredibly Mourinho-esque uh, performance. They were disciplined, they frustrated Bayern Munich. They won the game in uh, admirable fashion, if not thrilling fashion. That could be wrong. I could be doing them a disservice. Well, but but no, the, number the, one, the, the other two points. Anyway. Well, I know, I know, I know. So the other two points. One, Roberto Di Matteo walking up the steps, and when he gets to Abramovich, screaming and going, yes! And I was thinking, I'm not sure he's going to last here. I don't know if that's how Roman wants his manager to be. But anyway. And then, of course, John Terry. Full kit. Here I come. Parting of the blue sea. Let me on, everyone. John's here. I'm going full kit. I'm doing this. Um, and many, many other players would have done exactly the same. Well, not necessarily the full kit, but they would have wanted to be on there as well. I mean, he's such a kit Chelsea guy through and through that he was desperate to be part of it. From a Chelsea point of view, Chelsea fans all loved seeing him on there. Absolutely everyone. Oh, of them. course, yeah. Everybody else, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it's your own fault that you're not playing. The reason being, he was sent off in the semi-final against Barcelona, 37th minute, off the ball, just kick, just goes straight through the back of the, the attacking player. Yeah. No, no tackle, nothing like that, just a vicious pace. And that's the reason. It was the biggest brain freeze in history, which could have should have cost Chelsea. They shouldn't have been through that semi-final. But they got through the semi-final. I mean, there's GT who's actually disgraced himself, actually out there. But not one Chelsea supporter is complaining for a second. Mm. The other thing is very mem many things memorable, memorable about that final. Um, certainly a long way away from the best Chelsea team that had you know, been in any of those Champions Leagues. Long way away from the best team yeah. that they had. But they still managed to fight and battle their way through. Tactics were really interesting. Two left backs on the day. Weird, weird tactics. Never should have won. I'll tell you how unexpected the win was, right? I had a choice, and I can't remember if I've told you this before, Joe, but I was working for BBC Scotland TV at the time and also for Chelsea TV. Both different, never really mixed. However, on that day, my Scottish team, Hibernian, were playing in the cup final, the, F, the Scottish Cup final against Hearts. Now, they hadn't won the Scottish Cup for over 100 years. And this could be the day. Mm. And I'm supposed to be the main pundit in the studio. That night, Chelsea are playing the Champions League final away 
at Bayern Munich against Bayern Munich. Where's your money? My right. money was on Hibs. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't care where your money is. There's only one game you should be going to. But Hibs is my team. Uh. And Bernie's my team. It's over 100 years since they've won the Scottish Cup. They're playing against Hearts. <laughs> They're big rivals. So I decide not to go to Munich. Oh, no. and it, 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 so the madness of it, it got, it got so surreal. So, of course, Hibernian get beat 5-1 by Hearts. Horror show, nightmare. I'm the guy in the telly that's getting dogs abused. And right, was, I, I can't believe this. And then I need to do the highlights that night. However, remember the way it works. Hibs game's finished about 5 o'clock. Chelsea game starts. I'm doing the highlights just after 10 o'clock. So I'm watching the Chelsea game against Bayern. But I've got plenty of time because, you know, obviously yeah. they're going to, it's going to finish and I've got plenty of time. But it goes to extra time. And then it goes to penalty kicks. And this is exactly what happened. I'm in the studio and I've got the earpiece in and I'm watching the Chelsea game, and I'm hearing the guy counting down 30 seconds to live on air to do this live big television show. Didier Drogba walks up to take the penalty oh. kick to win the Champions League. And I'm going, what? I need to watch, I need to watch. Stop. When it comes to 10 seconds, the ball hits the back of the net. I'm jumping about like a lunatic, jumping about in this, in this studio, going absolutely mad. And hear me here, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Mr. Sensible. Wow. Because I can't let the Hibs fans see that I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the Hibby as well. It was the most, honestly, I, had, I did a thing afterwards. I was writing for the Chelsea website. And I write every week for them. I have done for forever. Yeah. And I, after that, I just thought, I'm not even going to ask, write anything. Just tell me what you did when that goal went in. Because what I did was really weird. Right. I've never jumped about like a loony like that in my life, especially in the studio when you're going live on, on air in three seconds. And the stories I got in were incredible. From three broken legs, three people broke their legs, as they jumped up and fell through tables. All mm. One guy told me he was in a dog hole. You know, so he was, he was actually in a battle. He was a medic, but there was shots being fired above him. <laughs> and he was listening to it on the radio. And the, honestly, the stories were absolutely extraordinary about it. And, you know, it's it's an amazing thing that Chelsea, the time they absolutely did not think they were going to yeah. do it, was the day they done it. Yeah, it was such a postscript to the really peak years, and and, and boom, you know, for for Lampard and for Terry, it was this amazing finale. I'm sure for them, uh, we have about two two and a half minutes, so it is time for you to unveil. You've given this some thought. You've looked yeah. through uh, the Chelsea of the 21st century, primarily here. What is your Champions League moment? What are you going with? Well, the Champions League moment is, is very special. It was the semi-final that year. It wasn't the final. It was the semi-final against Barcelona. Um, so Chelsea are playing against them. They've not got much of a chance. They're away at Barcelona. They have to get a result. They have to get at least a draw over there. They have no chance. What does John Terry do? He gets sent off after mm. 37 minutes. You're team, talking about a team that's got Xavi, Iniesta, Messi. You know, they, they are just Busquets, the whole bunch. And Chelsea, after 12 minutes, also lost the other centre-half, Gary Cahill. So they've ha they haven't got a defence. They have no chance, right? <laughs> and they're just the weirdest things happen. Barca keep on trying to cross the balls in high. They've, they've got Sanchez in the middle. Mm. They've got Messi in the middle. They have no chance. They're never mm. going to do it. They keep on doing this. Chelsea have a breakaway goal. Ramirez scores the most incredible dink oh, goal. Oh, yeah, the dink. Yeah, out of the nowhere. Dink. Right, I don't know where, and you just think, you've not got that in your locker, no. mate. Where the hell's that come from? <laughs> it was just so magical, and I'm doing the commentary, and it was amazing. But the best bit, and it's still, this is the best bit, and it stays with me, and it always will stay with me. Um, I'm doing it on, I'm doing it I'm at Stamford Bridge as a TV commentary, because I have to do it for Chelsea TV from there. They've got a corner, they're trying to score, Chelsea break, and it gets up to Torres. And then it takes you about four or five seconds to realise, actually, they haven't got any defenders. Mm. It re it's, a, it's this dawning, this wonderful, wonderful dawning of, actually, he's got 50 yards on his own here. <laughs> and it's Torres, and it's against Barcelona, and it's the hell that Torres has gone through. And it's the kind of, the anticipation and build-up of, your mind has time to figure this all out. If he scores here, Chelsea are in the Champions League final. Yeah. They can't come back. It's too late. It's an away goal. It's all those things. And the beauty and the ease. And to be honest, 
Torres misses chances, we know that, but one in ones is pretty good. Mm. And you never for a moment thought he was going to miss it. So I know the, the final and DDA scoring and the header late on against Bayern Munich. But if there's a spine tingling moment for you know, a lot of Chelsea fans, and certainly me, watching that moment when he breaks away, when I realise, oh my God, he's on his own, there's nobody for 50 yards. That is by a mile my favourite moment in that whole thing. Um, still didn't make me think I w- they were going to win it. <laughs> <laughs> But it was extraordinary. And it was, considering how long it takes, that's a decade. That's just about a, nearly a decade. The amount of money that Romans put into that is extraordinary. And for that moment to get him to the final and they finally won it, it was, uh, it was, it was an amazing journey. It was, and for every Chelsea fan that will say to you, especially the older ones that have been there and done that and seen that, yeah. you know, they never ever thought it would happen. Never, really. The, the chances in 15 years before that would not a snowball's chance in hell. Yeah, there they were at the top of the world football and, and to some degree deservedly so because they'd come so close so many times. Pat, beautifully done. Thanks so much for that. Pleasure as ever, guys. We'll check in next week. Pat and Evan there. Uh, and over the next few weeks, as we said, we're going to bring you some more of our Champions League Best Moment series with thanks to Virgin Media Sport, hashtag we free sport. Now, it's not just going to be the likes of Neil Mellor who played in these games yesterday or Pat who, uh, as a pundit, has watched them all and, and, and analysed them all. Uh, next week, we are going to bring on Leeds United superfan and, OK, economist in his spare time. David McWilliams is going to join us and give us his Leeds United moment in Europe. So we'll do that next week. Off the ball. On the-